Hi, and welcome to Designed for Life, the podcast that brings design and technology teachers and business leaders from across the UK together as we collectively seek to inspire, energize, and create the workforce of the future. Hi, and as our American friend introduced right at the beginning there, welcome to Designed for Life, the new podcast brought to you by the Design and Technology Association. My name's Tony Ryan. I've got the great honour and privilege of being Chief Exec of the Association. And over the course of the coming weeks, months and we hope years, we aim to bring in-depth interviews with leaders from across the sectors of design and technology. Everyone from Ofsted through to business and industry, from textiles through architecture into manufacturing and engineering and everything in between. So let's get to pod number one, and I'm delighted to welcome today to our first podcast, Brian Oppenheim. Brian is HMI for Ofsted with responsibility for design and technology. Brian, thanks so much for coming in today, and really, we're just going to start off with with you at school. Can you tell us a little bit about what were you like as a student? Well, as a student, I think I wasn't very academic, to say the least, so Maths, English, and the academic subjects were not my thing. But what I was good at was making things. I suppose woodwork is what you'd call it now. But I was good at making things. And it was that, really, that led me into, I suppose, being better at some of the academic subjects. So I realised by the time I got into the sixth form that actually I could write and I could add up. And it was all through technology or through doing woodwork that enabled me to do all those things. So you left school at what age? So I left school at 18, and then I went straight to Teachers Training College. Okay, so straight into teaching? Straight into teaching, to to Loughborough. Straight into design and technology? Straight into design and technology, although it was called Creative Design at Loughborough. Okay, so what drew that decision? What made you want to do that? Well, I think all my teachers were very clear that teaching was something that I ought to think about seriously. They thought I'd make a good teacher. And I suppose really it was my design technology teacher who was hugely influential, a really fantastic teacher who I wanted to emulate. He was my role model. And he went to Loughborough. And that's why I went to Loughborough, I think. Was there any teaching in the family? Any history of it? My mother had been a teacher when she was first married. I don't think a qualified teacher, but a teacher. In, right, but she, had Hamley, but she had some experience. She had some experience or something. Most of my family are social workers. So oh, right. Okay. Not quite teaching. Yeah, yeah. Not quite, but yeah. uh, nearly. Yeah. <laughs> so the first job, so when you left Loughborough, what was the first job? So the first job was, as I suppose you'd only call it a woodwork teacher in those days, at a school in Bethnal Green. In the oldest 1890 workshops, that you'd ever seen. All the tools were still wooden planes. So I had all these pupils trying to use wooden planes. I can, I can smell the dust in the place now. I can, I can actually, I can taste it almost. <laughs> First year of raising the school leaving age as well. So I had all these year 11s, fifth years as they were known in those days, yeah, yeah. who didn't want to be there at all. Okay. But I had to teach on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Someone's got to teach on a Friday Someone's afternoon. That's teach. the way it works. Yeah. So that was a baptism of fire. It was a bit of a baptism, yes. Yes. Yeah, I had one of those as well yeah. many, many years ago. I went yeah. to school. It was an yeah. East London school and it was either, it was survive or die, one or the other. That's and right. I survived. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the interesting thing was, there was no curriculum that I was given. I was told in the summer holidays before I started, draw up a scheme of work. So do, do what you want. Do, do what, what you want. want. Do yes. what you want. Keep them busy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. how did that go? Well, were, first, were there moments? There must have been. There must have been moments. No, there were definitely <laughs> moments. There were definitely moments. I do remember on a Friday afternoon when they'd all gone home, eventually kind of got rid of them all, and I'd have to go outside and pick the tools up that they'd thrown out the window. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, that was success. So I, was, I, I taught at a school in Hackney and keeping them in the classroom for an hour was success. That was yeah. many, many, many years ago. And uh, what was interesting was you got the credibility for being there, not disappearing. In fact, you came back every Friday and they knew that and they knew that I wasn't just going to yeah. kind of run away. Yes, we can't shake this one off. He's going to stay with us. Yeah, How long were you at that school? So I was there for two years. At the end of the first year, or while I was there in the first year, they were building new workshops, so I was responsible for commissioning the new workshops, okay. which was a really interesting piece of Two experience. years into teaching? 
a year into a teaching. Year into teaching. So that was all the things that you do to commission a new workshop. Yeah, which was I, I, I tell people now, I got, I got promoted one year into teaching as well. Yeah, and it was like, because yeah. there was a massive shortage of teachers. That's, That's what I always say. Yeah. So you were commissioning a whole new place, and that was within the first school that you worked at? Yeah, that was in the first school, and I was there for two years, and I moved to another school where I was second in department right. after two years. Yeah, yeah. And I think I was there for four years there, the last year of which I was the acting head of department Okay. because the head of department had left and they couldn't appoint anybody else. They appointed someone else as head of department eventually, so I left and went to another school in London, in Hackney this time, as head of department. Right, okay. So how many years were you head of department? Three and then up for, I suppose, about um, eight or nine years. So a good, so good spell as head of department. Yeah. It's a real comfort, and I know we've spoken before off mic, but it's a real comfort to have somebody leading the subject for Ofsted that actually has been through that has done that because you've you, you've been in the workshop you know what it's like oh, um, absolutely, yes. you're not dragged in from outside with a, a sort of briefing as to what no. design and technology is no, all no, about. no 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 I've, I've been there i've smelt the dust and... yeah absolutely so what was your first involvement with ofsted then how did that come about well the bit in between that kind of teaching and ofsted so when i was teaching my last head of department's job was at holland park school in west london mm-hmm. and during that time because the london design and technology inspector team or the staff inspector for design technology thought I'd done a a really good job in putting the the department back on track. He asked me if I'd be the advisory teacher, seconded job. So I was an advisory teacher for nearly two years, at the end of which there was a job advertised in London as an inspector for design technology, which I applied for and got. Okay. And then they abolished, the, or the government of the day abolished the Inner London Education. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's where I came in. I was, yeah. I was, I was one year into ILEA. I just right. managed to get seconded in. Okay, well, I was there from 19, whenever it was, 103 to the end of India. And originally, I got a job in Tower Hamlets. They offered me a job because the team I was with all got kind of transferred across. But they hadn't offered me any contract. And I found a job as senior county inspector for design technology in Essex, which I applied for and got. Okay. So I became the senior county inspector for design technology, particularly introducing the national curriculum. And that's where you cut your inspection teeth, as it were, is in Essex, yeah? Well, probably in London, actually, more likely right. in London. The Essex work was much more advisory than it was in London, which was more inspectorial. Okay, in those days that we used to have in advisors. advisors and work. Yeah. So you must have worked with Mike Ive as well? You must have worked with I did work with Mike Ive. I didn't know him well, but I yeah. did work with Mike Ive. I remember ALEA and Black Prince Road, I think it yes. was, where we used to go for training. We used to have uh, compulsory training every Friday, yeah. which was yeah. incredible. And I was an advisory teacher, that's where I was based, at Black Prince. Was it really? Yeah. From conversations that we've had before, hopefully this gives a little bit of context to it, but I mean, you care about this subject, but what is it about the subject that actually is so important to you? For me, what's been really significant about design and technology is the doors that it's opened up in terms of helping me to realise that actually I wasn't an academic, I wasn't academically thick even though some people might have thought I was because I taught woodwork, and that there was so much in design technology that you needed to know about from a much wider kind of source, realm of knowledge than you would have done if it was another subject. So a big breadth in there. I mean, for me, that awakening came for me as a car mechanic where I fell out of school thinking I was thick. And it was the work that I did as a car mechanic, that the science that I did and the maths I did, because there was a reason to learn it, all of a sudden I was off. Yeah, and that, that's exactly what happened to me. When I was in teaching in London, particularly in my last head of department role, and then as advisory teacher, I worked very closely with the, the senior inspector for design technology in London on developing the technology side of design and technology as it was then. Yeah. We introduced all sorts of courses on things like electronics and pneumatics and mechanics. And 555 chips and that sort five, of stuff. Five, yeah, five I remember, chips remember them well. Yes. Remember them well. Yeah, yeah, with the yes. soldering arm while the kids burnt out the 555 chip that's, completely. That's right. Those were the days. They um, were indeed. <laughs> yeah, we had lots of those, yes. 
lots of trips to RS components for all the resistors. RS did very, very well out of my department, I seem to recall. Yeah, that was the, that was the main place for ordering. Exactly. Um, yes. So looking as you do today, I mean, I guess you get a real helicopter view on the subject. Yes, um, yeah. I mean, I've been very lucky because when I was in Essex, that's when Ofsted were created. And my job was dependent on passing... Ofsted inspector training. So in 1992, I passed and became an Ofsted inspector then, and led my first led the first inspection, Ofsted inspection, to a secondary school in 1993. So wow. it's been quite a long time. You've been doing it a while. I've know. been doing it a while. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there are only a handful of us who've been doing it. You passed long. your probation now. Yeah, you're, you're I okay. think you're so. safe to go. Yes. Um, so I think you, you, could you ask me about you know what my observations yeah, about the just, technology just, are? The biggest observation, I've put it over all of the 26, 27 years, is how design technology has, I'm not sure fallen out of favour is the right term, but there's less and less of it when you go into schools. There are some schools that just don't do it, or if they do, it's a watered-down version of it. Yeah. A lot of schools don't have the equipment anymore, they've got rid of it, yeah. but they're not the workshops. That's the part I think that I notice most. The other part of it is that as soon as I tell people that design technology is my subject, they want to squeeze me for as much information as they can about how can they make it better in their school. Yeah. So I think there is a recognition that for many pupils, design technology has got all sorts of benefits. And this squeezing, is this coming from teachers, heads of department, or is it coming from school leaders, or is it a mixture? I suspect it, it's a mixture. Right. It's a mixture. So uh, my, my observations would be that over the years, where design technology has failed, it has been in terms of the quality of education that it's been providing. Yeah. It just hasn't been the quality there. There have been people who haven't moved swiftly enough to take on the new ideas. And... When a subject fails, most head teachers are going to say, well, look, you know, I'm not going to put money into something that isn't working. I might as well put it into success, not into failure. It's the leadership that worries me. It's the shortage of quality leaders in the subjects out there that worries me at the moment because mm-hmm. as an ex-head, you're only going to put money, you're right, where you've got leadership. And if you haven't got leadership in that department, you're not going to do it. And I talk to heads fairly regularly, too regularly now, who, who say that they've advertised three times and they haven't been able to appoint. So therefore, they're not going to carry on with yeah. the subject. But the problem is, once you close the workshops, that's, it. that's never coming back, is it? No. And I think that when I look back over my career and look back over the time I was teaching, that was one of the things that was significant about working in Inner London, was that they provided training on leadership. I can remember going on a training course as a head of department how you are, how to become an effective leader, or how to maintain effective leadership. That doesn't happen for people much. No, 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 no. So, I mean, the next question really I've got for you is you must see not only the strengths of the subject, but the areas that are weak at the moment within the subject. What would you identify as being both? What are the strengths, Mm. first of all? The strengths are that design and technology, where it's working well, motivates pupils. They love it. If you talk to them about which are their favourite subjects. Engagement's never been an issue, has it? Never been an issue. Never been an issue. That's not to say that they always say that, because if it's not taught well, they'll say actually they don't like it. But generally, design technology is a subject they like. They like it because it's something different from sitting at a desk. Yeah. Yeah. And they like the activity, they like the practical side of it. Uh, I'm guessing engagement as well, sorry to interrupt, I'm guessing engagement as well doesn't mean that the quality is there. I mean, you can keep kids busy and happy without it being good. Absolutely, you can, you can. But I think that's one of the things that you really do notice about the engagement. And of course, if you're not experienced in what design technology is all about, it's very easy to look at it and say, but this must be good because all these pupils are engaged, they're all enjoying it, they're having fun, and look, they've produced all these interesting little objects yeah but that doesn't mean to say that it's good or it doesn't mean to say that it's valuable no it might have kept them busy so what are the good bits when you see a school because uh, i know myself that i can sniff a good department within three minutes of being in there yeah what is it i mean it's an impossible question but what is it that makes a department tick and stand out 
there are a lot of things that contribute to it, and there's no one silver bullet that no. would say actually this is this is, this, this is the question. This is this is the this is the silver bullet that will make sure that your department is really good. But I think that the one of the factors that that makes for a really good department is that everybody in the department is on board with whatever the kind of mission, the, the purpose of what the yeah. department's up to. And of course, the department's yeah. got a purpose. They've got a purpose. Yes. And they know what it is, and they're all up for that, and they're all working towards that. Even if they don't always get it right, yeah. they know where they're going. And that, that purpose, that mission, if you like, is based on a proper educational debate about what what are we doing and why are we doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's that's always been my. People have called it the chip on my shoulder. Really, is that because of my experience at school and me coming out at sixteen, thinking that I wasn't academically switched on. I guess as a as a senior leader and as a teacher and as a head teacher, I never wanted any other student to experience that the same way. I wanted kids to realise so. And the link for me has always been. Telling a 14-year-old that they're doing something for an exam has ne never cut it with me at 14, and I don't think cuts it with many kids. Mm -hmm. You've got to show them why they're learning, what they're learning, and how that links to the real world, and I think our subject does that really well. Yes, absolutely. And I think, too, if I go back to my school career, what was significant about my school career was that the teachers believed in me, even though I didn't seem to be academically bright. Yeah. They believed in me and allowed me to pursue my kind of practical interests, realising that by doing that, it would have a knock-on effect eventually onto other, into other subjects. And I yeah. think that, for me, I thought, actually, that's, there's something there about design technology that provides pupils with, with success where perhaps they're not achieving success elsewhere that will allow them to get on with other subjects as well. Kind of yeah. not, that knock-on effect, I think, is just really powerful. Yeah, and sort of switches the light on, and then when yeah. that, once that light's on, then, then you find that kids just want more and more and yeah. more. I was in a school a while ago, it was 6.30 in the evening, and they were throwing the students out. They didn't want to go home yeah. um, because yeah. they loved what they were doing. Yeah. And that's not unusual in our subject. No, no, absolutely. Can I come to now, if, mm. if, if we look at primary, I'm going to mm. start with primary first mm -hmm. of all, and, and there's been a... A massive change that we've noticed at the association in primary uptake, really, over the mm. course of the last six months, mm. which we can only put down to the new Ofsted framework, where this idea of a broad curriculum and a rich curriculum is, is really hitting home at primary level now. And uh, we're picking up members hand over fist at the moment, which is great news, and we want to support those teachers because many of them, we're doing a, a paper at the moment with the Royal Academy of Engineering, and What's come out of that paper is that the average primary teacher gets about six hours of DT teaching as part of their ITE. So, I mean, what are your observations at primary? Well, interestingly, I also lead inspections of ITE. And at the moment, of course, Ofsted's got a consultation about, mm. about ITE. Yep. And I've led one of the methodology pilots, and I have another one coming up shortly. One of the things that we've found is that Absolutely. Subject expertise isn't always there. Yeah. There's often an over-reliance, partly because some of these IT providers find it really difficult to get the expertise. There's an over-reliance on the mentors in schools. And then they, they don't have that subject expertise. Yeah. Either. yeah, yeah. And also that the way in which the course is run means that there isn't a lot of time for them to get that subject, that subject expertise. So... I don't know whether the new framework, because it's not yet determined properly, because it's still out for consultation, will try to address that balance. This is the ITE framework. The ITE yeah. framework. Yeah. But there certainly will be something more about, about subject expertise, making sure that primary teachers have sufficient subject expertise. I must admit, as a secondary teacher, I am absolutely in awe of anybody that teaches primary yes. because how you do the, all those subjects and, uh -huh. and motivate and push kids on in those subjects is, is just impossible. We, yes. we did one course a while ago yeah. that, that you spoke at in Birmingham mm -hmm. and, and I just asked for a show of hands, about 140 people in the room, how many of you have had subject training in this? About eight people put their hand yeah. up. So, yeah. you know, that's a, 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 a random poll, but if that's reflective of national, then we... 
mm. we can see that mm. there's an awful lot of learning to do at primary. Yes, no, absolutely. I think that's well, that's right. I suppose too, and you probably got a question about this, but I suppose too that then it links in to what sort of training there is available for teachers in post, as it were, the yeah. kind of CPD. And of course, that's the other question for uh, schools: is how can they afford that CPD? Because money's tight, time is tight, so the, 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 those two kind of squeeze things a bit. Absolutely. I mean, a subject, what we've noticed over the course of the last 12 months, especially, is the subject-specific CPD that really there is no money or very, very little money in schools. And I've, I've spoken to secondary schools with 1,200 students that used to have 40, 50,000 in the CPD budget, and it's now 10 grand. And with that, you're going to get exam board training at secondary mm. level, mm. or you're going to get literacy and numeracy training at primary level, but yeah. you're not going to get anything in design mm. and technology. No, absolutely. Um, so, mm. yeah, we, we, we're desperately trying to find ways that we can make access to that training easier because we want to support teachers at primary and at secondary. Obviously, training, subject-specific training is critical. Mm. So what about transition? I mean, that from, from primary to secondary education... I mean, what I'm thinking ahead is if, if the trends that we've seen at the association in the last six months continue, you're going to get some much, much better prepared students arriving at secondary, which, which secondary colleagues need to be ready for. Is, is that what you're seeing out there at the moment? I haven't seen that yet. Right. But I think there is a growing awareness in secondary schools that what will be happening in the future in primary schools will have a, an impact on them. Yeah. But I haven't seen the evidence of that yet. It's a bit early, probably. It's a bit early, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's move into to secondary. And, I mean, one of the things that, that we get regularly, especially when it, it comes around to writing timetables and that time of year, is the, the old nutmeg of the carousel. Yeah. And can you have a carousel where you've got real progression coming through? Now, I know Ofsted's gripe with the carousel is, is not the carousel per se, but it's the lack of progression that you can see within that. Is that right? Absolutely, that's right. Because Ofsted would never say that they have a preferred style, that it no. should be a carousel or it should be something else. No. They should would never say that. The question is, to what extent do the components of the carousel contribute to a whole picture of design and technology? Yeah. Rather than repeating things. And I'm sure we've all seen, you've seen, carousels where they'll do something in in one material and they'll do something in another material but actually the skills and the knowledge are not dissimilar and all they're really doing is repeating the same things yeah if you're not careful you can uh, repeat it with a different end product exactly and as the, the end product becomes the, the important bit rather than what you're putting into it i'm going to come to that later on we're going to talk about that a little bit later on Really, when you're looking, doesn't matter whether it's a carousel, whether you're looking at straight blocks of teaching, whichever way you're doing it, really what we're saying at the moment is you've got the students in year seven, they're going to go to, let's say, 13, age 13, uh, year nine, and what learning do you want to take place? I mean, the word that I'm trying to ban in schools is projects. Yes, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's what secondary schools need to be absolutely clear about amongst themselves, the departments. And actually, the senior leaders too, they, should, they need to be part of this conversation. What is it that you want every child by the end of year nine to be able to know and be able to do? That's the key. Yeah. And that is what is missing in a lot of the carousels. It, as you said, it's a series of projects. Well, we'll do, you know, we'll do a we'll do a clock project. Yeah, we'll, and it's fixated uh, on the outcome and it's not yeah. fixated on the learning that yes. gets the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. So it's what you want the students to know, what you want them to be able to do. I mean, I, I, I'm always pushing a third one on that, which is I believe that we can teach character through our subjects. So. I think that's absolutely right. And I think there is a great, there's a huge amount of that, that aspect that Costed calls spiritual, moral, social and cultural development yeah. Yeah, yeah. that is in design technology. Things like teamwork, yeah. things like tenacity, tenacity and... Uh, being able to pursue something even though it's not going right and come back to it and, yeah. and, and carry on. 
And I've got a big thing about failure that I think schools at the moment, some schools, I don't, I don't want to use the blanket term there, but some schools are almost risk adverse and our subject can't be. You know, failing is part of the process, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. And of course, if you talk about it being failing, that's the problem. It isn't failing, actually. It's learning. Yeah. But, but we've got into the habit of saying failure yeah. because the system tends to look at success and failure as a kind of binary thing. I think it was Elon Musk a short while ago, there was a, it was a quote that's been repeated badly, and I'm probably going to get it wrong now, but uh, he said, if you're not failing, then you're not trying hard enough. Yes, yeah, um, I've, I heard that recently, too, actually, funnily enough. Yeah, um, but, yes. yeah, I, 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 yeah, I get that completely. But I, I guess you touched on it a little bit earlier on, is, is that we're doing different things now to most of the other curriculum areas, and we are asking the students to just physically they're up and they're out of their chairs and they're moving around and mm. they are failing they are going to get stuff wrong mm. and we need to let them go sometimes and let them mm. find out for themselves what's yes. not working yes. and it's a big ask for students isn't it, it when, is. when they're being not spoon fed I don't want to use that I don't want to suggest that but they're actually being given a body of knowledge that they've got to learn elsewhere but not necessarily being asked to put it into practice in the same way yes I think so but I wouldn't go too far down that line because I think the whole point of looking at the curriculum and its breadth and its depth is about saying that there is more to learning a subject than just learning the facts. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter what it is. No, no, no. And that's always been the problem for design technology, being able to distinguish between what's the knowledge, what are the facts that we want to learn, and what are the skills that we want to learn, and what do we want to be able to do? Now, from an Ofsted perspective, there is no difference, really. there's no binary between skills and knowledge. In order to perform a skill, you need the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one feeds the other. One feeds the other. You can't do one without the other. Really. No. And where schools talk about a skills-based curriculum, they may not be on the right track in terms of the knowledge that needs to be covered. That's a real cultural thing that we've got here, I think, in this country that other countries don't suffer from. And if you look at Germany, they, they really don't differentiate between skills and knowledge, do they? No, it's, no. It's, it's a bit of both. It's a bit um, of both, yeah. And, and it should be here as well. But we we seem to have, uh, uh, again, I'm going back to the chip on my shoulder again, but you know, if, if you're practical, therefore you're not quite as clever as somebody no. else. And it's very strong. It was certainly strong when I was teaching. I can remember when I was at Holland Park, we managed to get design and technology as a core subject up to the age of 16 before the national curriculum. So it was a pretty important coup, really. Yeah. But being justified to the pupils by senior leaders as, well, when you leave school, you'll need to be able to put shelves up in your house. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can do it, by the way. I can put shelves up. So, yes. so, so it didn't fail me there. No, no, no. But you know what I mean? I mean yeah, absolutely. Not the reason for doing no, that it's, it's not. It's not. I mean, I, I've, I've got two bright kids, but I wouldn't let them near a shelf. <laughs> when we're looking at curriculum, so if we're looking overall, I was at a school in Leicester last year, and they'd nailed it. They had actually a path on the wall, which a lot of schools I know are doing now, where they had the students coming in in year seven, and they had the A-level leavers at 18, and they sold it to the students that you get two chances to leave this subject. That's how important it is. But other than that, our expectation is that you're going to follow this all the way through. And their take-up rate at GCSE and A-level was phenomenal. And I think it is a mindset that they put into those kids is that that's the way it's going to be. You're listening to Designed for Life, bringing design and technology teachers and business leaders from across the UK together. What makes a good curriculum with design and technology? If you're looking at that journey, let's not go to A-level, let's just go to GCSE. What is it that makes a good curriculum as far as Ofsted is concerned? It's ambition for the pupils. Yeah. And making sure that the curriculum is structured in a way that builds progression in and that the sequence of tasks builds that progression in. It's that sequencing and structure and ambition that are the keys for a successful curriculum. And that's what Austin will be looking for. They'll be 
really looking hard at that. Look, schools don't have to have used those words, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really yeah. That's your words, yeah. I get that. That's Ofsted's words. And, you know, whatever, whatever Ofsted uses, that's for Ofsted. Yeah. Schools don't have to. Teachers don't have to. Whatever they use, which they understand and make sense, is absolutely fine. But the key is making sure that there is a coherent plan from the beginning to the end. Yeah. That the teachers know at the beginning and the pupils, but particularly the teachers, where is it that all this is going? What is it we want pupils to now be able to do by the end of this? What's our end point? What are the end points of this yeah. course? So a vision for the subjects. Absolutely. Context with the kids that you've got. So you yeah. actually know the knowledge levels with them arriving from primary into you, which will probably be all over the place. All over the place. I'm sure they will be, yes. But you've done some assessment of that, so at least you know that. Because, I, 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 you know, the worst case scenario is you just ignore what was done at primary and you just start from the baseline, which right. I, I've seen it done. I don't condone it at all because... In some areas, you'll get kids that come in at a very high level from primary school. Mm -hmm. It's just discounting what primary colleagues are doing. Mm -hmm. And then pushing those students on to a vision for what's possible with this subject. And I think personally, we've got to show what this subject can lead to because in the two years that I've been in post, some of the jobs that I've seen out there that are just evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was 16 again, it would be a wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, there's some great jobs out there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think kids know. I don't think they no. know. I don't think teachers know no. either. The, the, no. Just the breadth of job out there. No, absolutely. And I'm sure you've heard, this is anecdotal evidence for me, but i heard of employers who say one of the reasons that they find design technology students better to employ is that they don't just follow instructions. They try things out. They use their initiative. They've got resilience, so when it goes wrong, they can come back again and try a different way. Okay. Whereas other students who may have done extremely well at GCSE are just waiting to be fed the next problem or the, the next piece of information. Yeah. One employer described it to me a while ago. He said, we've got very, very bright kids coming out of school. They're packed full of knowledge, but they haven't really got a clue how to use it. And we've got to spend six months teaching them how to use it because the school system hasn't taught them that. And I think that's a danger with a knowledge-based curriculum is mm. that kids do come out full of knowledge, but the application is something that mm. they're just not being taught in mm. some schools, not mm. in every school. Mm. Let's go to the new framework now. Mm. I mean, it's not that new now. It's, it's embedded, but uh, or embedding, I should say. It, um, it obviously took some time in the planning. What was the driver for the new direction and how were Ofsted inspectors trained to work under what is a very, very different framework from what came before? Well, I think there were a number of drivers, but perhaps the most significant one, at least as I understand it, is Chief Inspector's view that we were doing pupils a disservice by just looking at GCSE outcomes in secondary and SATs outcomes in primary. Yeah. Because those outcomes only examine part of what we would consider to be a good curriculum. Or not we, but generally in society, yeah, 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 yeah. considered to be a good curriculum. Amen to that. There was an accusation put at Ofsted on the old framework that really two-thirds of the decision could be made without visiting the school. Yes. I'm not saying it was, no. but it could be. Yes, and, and the data was the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. That was what the problem was. So yeah. people would be desperately trying to make sure their data looked good, but not necessarily looking at the substance of the curriculum yeah and i think all another one of the drivers also has been that ofsted tried to base its views about the new curriculum and its decisions about the new curriculum on research particularly in relation to cognitive psychology and learning in the kind of the, the cognitive psychological framework and that that has been quite instrumental in what we have been trained as Ofsted inspectors to understand, as it yeah. were. For me, it's been absolutely fascinating. So that, for example, and this is one of Ofsted's kind of training, I don't think mantra would be the right term, but certainly it's come across very, very strongly. The curriculum should be allowing pupils to remember more so that they can learn more. And for us, it was illustrated, 
with a number of tasks where we were asked to read some passages from a book and imagine that we didn't understand some of these passages or put ourselves in the place of pupils. And you can see that you needed some of that knowledge yeah. in order to understand the passage. Another example, and, and primary colleagues might remember this, where there was a SATS paper where pupils were asked to read about the dodo and the extinction of the dodo. And a lot of schools complained, our pupils won't understand this because they've never come across it, they don't know the words. Yeah. And the point about that is the knowledge that they were being taught was not broad enough for them to make sense of it. And it's this idea that as you build up your knowledge over time, you make connections across the knowledge so that it becomes much more meaningful than just a set of knowledge in a box. In fact, that's some of the some of the theory is that knowledge is not a, a kind of a bucket of knowledge and here's a bit and here's a bit and, and so on. Actually, it's all joined up. Yeah. And it's making that joined up and making those connections for pupils that becomes the strong curriculum. And helping students to see how something they've learned in geography applies to something they're doing in DT, applies to something they're doing yes. in maths, and the whole lot then makes yes. sense. You can yes. join the whole thing together. Yeah, exactly. Without it being contrived, and that's, of yeah. course, is always the difficulty, how yeah. to make sure it's not, it's not contrived. But if everybody is thinking about, do these pupils remember this information? Do they remember this? so that when they go to another subject, they can recall it. And it's that bit about recalling it yeah. and it being in long-term memory. So true education is the stuff that you remember long after you've left school. Yes. Many, yes. many years after yes. you Yes, it's the long-term memory. It's putting it into long-term memory. And that requires some uh, repetition. It requires going back over some of those things yeah. and, and, you know, later on in the, in the course without repeating necessarily exactly the same thing but nevertheless repeating the concepts I and mean, then you try in our subject you try to get students to a point where in year 10 you can throw a problem at them and they can then use the skill bank that they've got that they've built up to tackle that problem yes exactly and you're not guiding them through it you're really standing back yeah. then and just prompting yeah. and, and facilitating yes. rather than teaching it up front that's right the cognitive psychology theory talks about connections in the brain and that you end up with this schema yep. in your brain of all this knowledge connected up. So you might not in design technology know everything that you need to know. You come across a problem, actually I don't know about yep. that. But what you remember about other things helps you to go off and look for new knowledge look in the right places. and look in the right places and yep. understand that new piece of knowledge because you've already got the previous piece as yep. it were. Because you could argue, I mean, you could argue this for any subject, but in our subject, you're never going to know it all. Never. You're never going to know it. You're always, but if you know where to look, then that's, that's a yes. very good place to start. Yeah. And I think that goes back to your bit about character building as well, that there's something about design and technology, attitudes to school, attitudes to learning in design and technology that are about not always having the answer, but having to find the answer about having to say, let's go back and look at what we do know and can we build on that? I think one of the beauties of our subject, without getting too uh, romantic about it, is kids are learning to solve problems and that doesn't necessarily have to be a design problem, it could be a life problem, but the same skill sets apply to it and who isn't going to meet problems in their life. Mm. Can we go back to um, just the training that HMI had to enable them to, to take on this change? Mm. How was that handled? Because it is a big shift. And you, you said there's a lot of psychology behind it, there's a lot of learning behind it, there's a lot of research behind it. But it must be very, very difficult to, I mean, if, if I get flippant for it for a minute, July you're doing under one framework and then in September you're on a new one and you've got to switch your head, well, which doesn't happen, but... No. <laughs> So the training for the framework was over at least two years. Mm -hmm. So it began a good two years ago, introducing some of the concepts about remembering more and learning more, understanding what progression was and that progression was not numbers on a, on a spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. And it's built up over time so that by the end of last summer term, for HMI anyway, it culminated in a three-day training for every HMI, which was really to reinforce 
and extend to some extent all the training that we've done in the previous previous two, two years. And of course, the training doesn't stop. So every time we do training, and we've just done some training actually, it's about reinforcing some of the concepts, right. especially in terms of using the experience of how the framework has worked and the quality of the reporting and so on, and saying, what more do we need to be able to do better? That is the focus of our training. Absolutely the focus of it. Was, I mean, you were six months in now. Yeah. What have been the, the real highs with regard to the new framework and what you're seeing in school? And, and what have been the difficult bit? What have been the most difficult bits about embedding and, and using it? Obviously, you go into a school, you've got the framework there. Mm. You've got to use the new framework. What's been the difficult bit about that? With, with Well, the difficult bit is helping school. Well, it's more than helping schools. It's making judgments that schools feel are unfair because we're not looking at the data anymore. Right. Okay. So schools that have been doing very well because they've got very strong data, but now aren't doing as well because their curriculums are not as coherent and as well structured and sequenced as they should be. So you're getting handed the A4 folders with all the data in it and you're saying, no, actually, I don't want to look at that. I want to look at your curriculum. specifically do not look at it. We are told, I mean, the framework has a I've heard this. section I've heard this. in it that says inspectors will not look at internal data. So you've got a data bank that you look at before you come into the school as an inspector. All we've got is the external data. Yeah, so the what's same it? as the school has got. So the time where senior leaders are forcing is the wrong word, but putting a system in place where data is being collected perhaps too often internally, that should stop. Well, we are asked to look at those data collection points. Yeah. How is it being used? And it links to, to workload because if teachers yeah. are collecting it six times a year, does that just increase their workload? Yeah. And what use is it? Yeah. And uh, what, what is it really and telling you six weeks on from when exactly. you last did it? Exactly. And from an inspector's point of view, you go into perhaps 10 schools in a term, you know, 20 or 30 schools a year. And every school has a slightly different way of collecting and presenting the data. If you have to understand it at each time, it's almost impossible. And anyway, it doesn't really tell you all that much. No. It might tell you that pupil X has moved from level one to level two or level three yeah, to yeah, level yeah. four. But what does level one mean? What does level two mean? What does level three mean? That has been part of our training too, in terms of do schools understand what assessment is? Have they really understood the purpose, the, purpose of the purpose of assessment? Right. And understood that GCSEs only test a small amount of the knowledge and skills that are taught of that subject. There will be a whole lot of things that they don't test. So if you teach to the exam, you are narrowing your curriculum. And that's where that narrowing comes from. Yeah, it's huge. That is it's huge. huge. We, we, we could do a separate podcast we just could. on that because... Yeah, you get your syllabus and you think, right, that's packed, that syllabus. And mm -hmm. there's more, obviously, there's more knowledge mm -hmm. within the GCSE now than there used to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can spend your whole time teaching that. And a, a student puts their hand up and asks a really clever question that's not on your lesson plan. Do you go off and answer that question? And go, But that comes back to your previous point, is if you provide the reference points around it, the kids will actually join the dots themselves. They'll make that up. You don't need to teach the whole lot verbatim, really. No. And that's it, I think. That's absolutely it. And that's why it's important for schools to be absolutely clear. What do you want pupils to know by the end of year nine? What is it's going to be important for those who don't go on and do the subject and for those who do go on and do the subject? What are the important things? Yeah. So it's not just about working backwards from GCSE. It's no, actually no. saying... In having a real debate about what do we as design technology teachers want these children to know, these pupils to know. Yeah, I'm passionate about that. It cannot be working down from 11. It's got to be working up from 7. And you're right, if a student leaves at the end of Key Stage 3, what is it that we've taught them that sticks with them for life? And I always say, you know, if they're the pickiest consumers ever when they go out to buy anything, then we're part way there at least. We're part way there. Yeah. Deep dives. I mean, there's been lots and lots and lots about it. And I, I don't know, I've, I've heard stories that we're possibly one of the few subjects that is welcoming a deep dive because we haven't been seen for years before that. 
And I've bumped into teachers who said, I want them to come and see me because we're proud of what we're doing and we've not been seen for years. So what is a deep dive and how deep is it? First thing to say about deep dives is that they are not subject inspections. So we're not inspecting the subject. What we're doing is trying to look at each subject and identify what are the barriers or not, as the case may be, to a good curriculum. So it may well be that it is a very well structured and sequenced curriculum. By doing more than one deep dive, and at least three and, and possibly six, inspectors are trying to identify the systemic issues that there may be in the curriculum. And I'll give you an example. This is These are the examples that we've been using in our training of... Yeah contracted in inspectors, officer inspectors, which is quite apposite for a design technology discussion. For example, you may well find in your house that there is a crack running down the wall across a doorway. You could just fill in the crack with a bit of filler, smooth it down, paint it again, and then in a year or two's time, the crack would appear again. The question is, why is it cracking? What is the systemic reason that that is cracking? Well, that's deep. <laughs> you, you know, you can, you can make up all sorts of yeah, analogies, yeah, yeah, but yeah. that was one of the analogies that they used, and I thought that was really interesting because it's trying to say, why is this curriculum not delivering a broad and deep and meaningful experience for pupils? Is it that there's a systemic question here? Yeah. And systemic questions could be, the way the timetable works, there yeah. could be training, it could be... Not pitched at the right level for the students, the or yeah. not recognising uh, uh, you know, EFL or something like that, maybe it, across yes. the board. Yeah, it could absolutely be. Sometimes it's not systemic, of course, you see it's just relevant to that subject, but other yeah. times you can see it's systemic. So the questions about the curriculum and the evaluations of the curriculum are not... Maths is doing very well, design technology isn't doing very well, although that does appear sometimes. But much more, this is where the way in which the whole curriculum is being structured and thought about and sequenced. And the problem with it is X, because it's systemic. Oh. So put that right, then you don't have to worry so much about how your curriculum is progressing. So there's two levels of that that I'm seeing. First of all is is at a department level, obviously you want, as we've said already, you want the head of department to have shared a vision for the subject within the school. Yes, yes. I mean, I think this is how lots of heads of department might either think about it, perceive it to be, or experience it if they've had an inspection is that all the focus is being put on heads of department. I know that's been something that's been in the, that's been yeah. in the press and people have been concerned about. But it's not to put the heads of department, the subject leads, in the spotlight above senior leadership. I was going to go there. I was going to go there because the second level really is that as senior leaders, the biggest responsibility you've got is getting the curriculum right for students across the board, isn't it? that moving from one subject to another, yes. they're not going to see subjects of real strength in other subjects where you've got, you know, a yes. dip. Yes. You're pushing every subject to the same height, which is so difficult to do yes. as an ex-head. I know, yes. especially if you've got staffing issues in one yes. subject. But I think it's also trying to look at the big picture through the deep dives. So an inspection team has five or six subjects done these deep dives into and what they find is that there is a systemic issue across the school that's really a yeah. senior leadership question yeah why why is this happening you need to look at this part of your so that could be SEM, that could be literacy it could it, be any one of a number of things absolutely but it, it will come out when you triangulate through different absolutely. subjects absolutely and i can think of examples of schools that i've inspected fairly recently exactly in your example where literacy was absolutely the key. They hadn't got the literacy right at the beginning. So as pupils moved through the school, yeah. they just didn't yeah. have the skill, they didn't have the knowledge, so it couldn't make sense of other parts of the curriculum. That makes perfect sense. Just the clarification, really, because uh, some good SLTs will share this with their staff, both at a primary or secondary level, but how are the deep dives identified? That's on that initial phone call with the head, isn't it? Yes. 
So that's an interesting question. And the principle is that there are some things that we have to look at. So in a primary school, early reading is a must. Yeah. And in both primary and secondary, there needs to be both core subjects and foundation subjects. But the decision about which subjects of the deep dive should be negotiation between the lead inspector and the senior management team or the lead inspector and the head teacher. Now, okay. negotiation doesn't mean that the school <laughs> makes no, all the running. They could try. They could try. <laughs> but it also means that the lead inspector doesn't make all the running. Okay. So there would be some negotiation. And for example, you may well find that a leader says, a head teacher says, well, I'd really like to go and look at modern foreign languages, for example, because we've got some really good outcomes yeah. in that. And the inspector would say, yes, but I've looked at your external data. And actually, in humanities, in history and geography, you don't seem to be doing nearly as well as you are in leadership and management. I'm very happy to look at modern foreign languages. Sure. But let's look, at, bounce. let's look at history and geography as well. Or indeed, the other way around. Sometimes our teachers will say, we've had some real problems with this subject we brought in some new stuff we think it's going really well and you say well we're very happy to look at that but let's look at this other subject that does seem to have been very successful what right. is it about that that is uh, making it successful that makes sense because yeah. you're trying to make a big judgment in a, a relatively short space of time you are. you are and the deep dives i guess would help that yes that's the idea the idea is that day one of the inspection you will do the deep dives that the team would have some sort of hypothesis by the end of the day, yeah. and that day two, you would look at other subjects, at kind of a broader spread across other subjects, to see to what extent the issues that you had identified, the hypothesis you've identified, exist across the school. And may not, of course. The anecdote is that there seems to be an awful lot more conversations with student groups than there were under the old framework. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, what is your learning like in this subject? What, what are the yes. areas that you're struggling with, etc.? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so the first component of a deep dive is talking to the subject leaders. Although you could say the very first component is the, is the high-level discussion with the head teachers over the phone. But on the inspection, one, the first component really is talking to the subject leaders about rationale and curriculum planning and so mm. on. There is also looking at lessons. So the questions might well be, you know, what are you doing your curriculum and a leader says well this is what we're doing your next part of that process would be say okay now show me where that's happening in the classroom and that's what you're doing and we're not looking at making judgments about teaching or learning or yep. engagement or motivation and that's a big one isn't it questioning because me as a teacher as opposed to me as a head teacher or whatever as soon as someone comes in your classroom, you feel like you're being judged personally, but it's the learning that you're judging, you're not judging the teaching. No, and you're judging to the extent to which the intention is being put into practice yeah. in the classroom. So they may have some fantastic intentions, yeah, yeah. and what you see in the classroom may match that absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's that that you're looking for. So you've got talking to staff... In fact, you talk to the leaders first, you see lessons, talk to the teachers about how they perceive it and how they plan for their lessons, talk to the pupils, yeah. and also to look at pupils' books. Yeah. But to be very careful when you're looking at pupils' books, not to draw conclusions about things like marking, because you can't draw things about marking. No. You can draw things, conclusions about things like coverage, possibly progression. But you have to be very careful about how you how you play that. But the idea is that you've got all these factors coming together and it's an overall evaluation you're making, taking account of all of those things, not just of one bit of it. That's two days summed up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty tall order for two days' work. It is, it is. And I, I've always thought that looking at it from the other side is that you come in and you get really a photograph of a school that you've then got to draw a judgment from and you've yeah. got to collect whatever you need to make sure that that photograph is as accurate as it can possibly yes. be. Yes. So it's a tricky job, there's no yes. doubt about it. It makes that very first conversation with the head teacher on the phone yeah. really important because you're having a high-level conversation with senior leaders probably yeah. and you are trying to 
get a view about where the curriculum is strongest yeah. and where there may be areas for improvement. Sure. So that when the team come into the school first thing in the morning, they're not starting from a position of, we don't know anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of starting it, hitting the ground running is the way in which we've described it. And that conversation with the head, or I know some heads bring deputies or whatever into that conversation. Yes. That conversation really steers your, your beginning of your first day, really, it where does. you're testing what the head has said to you. It does, it does. And that's why the very first thing that you do once you've got into a school now is to talk to subject leaders and not to senior leaders, which is what we would have done in the past, because I've had that conversation yeah. on the telephone. Yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. Moving away from the framework a little bit, I mean, just looking overall, I mean, there's been a number of shouts, and I'm not sure whether you can give me an opinion on this or not, but I'll have a go. Ofsted outstanding. For me, divisive. Schools are either good enough or they're not good enough. And there are many schools at the moment, I think, that have been on outstanding for a long time that still haven't been inspected for quite a while that are now getting inspected, which I think is a good thing. Do you think we'll ever reach a day, let's put it this way, where there won't be an outstanding judgment? Do you see it as divisive? I'll put the other side. I won't say whether I feel. I didn't think you would. But I thought <laughs> put the other side. And the other side is by having an outstanding judgment, there is, if you like, an ambitious outcome for all schools, retaining an ambition. Yeah. Whereas if you just have a binary, if you just have yes or no, pass or fail, good yeah. or not good, yeah. then schools will have no incentive necessarily to get any, to do any better than good. Don't need to get any further. I've passed my Elstead, that's fine. Okay. So you think there might be a fear that, that good enough that will do? Yes. No, okay. I, I suspect that's where it, yeah. where it comes from. I have heard that view yeah. because Elstead is always looking at that. I think it's not something that Elstead will just close down because I'm sure that at each time they reflect on how well the framework is going, there will be views about whether that should happen or not, just as there are views about whether inspections should be no notice or not. Yeah, I'm just thinking how good that school is, how good a good school is, could very well be defined within the report that comes out, couldn't it? So a report could say this school is really doing well in these areas yes. whereas a report of a school that's just if you like just scraped into good yeah would reflect that in the report yes. so it's, there's still yes. possible there's to still do it. possibilities i just hate those banners outside schools that say this school is yes. outstanding and yes. it, 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 especially yes. in an area where there are schools up the road that aren't outstanding yes. and, uh, it, i don't know maybe that's a maybe that's a personal that, gripe yeah. i don't know um, that's, that, that's probably a strategic question for Austin, which i'm not yeah able to answer. fair enough fair enough before the new framework, and uh, just sort of getting close to the end now, before the new framework, uh, we did a check and we found two reports in three years that actually mentioned design and technology, which I was quite shocked at, really. Anecdotally, again, and that's all I've got at the moment, it appears that we're being seen an awful lot more at the moment. Is that your experience? And, you know, obviously, as the lead for Ofsted for design and technology, is that something that you want? You want us to be uh, uh, absolutely. I think if we're going to look at the breadth of the curriculum, then we will need to look at the foundation subjects and the other foundation subjects. Because you could, could say, well, history, geography, modern foreign languages, yeah. those are the foundation subjects. But the other foundation subjects that don't contribute towards EVAC are also important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There is a, a tension between back and the broad curriculum to some extent but Ofsted's view would be don't be critical of back after all would you really want a curriculum that doesn't include history and geography as part of what pupils study I often got slated as a head because I didn't I, I still don't really have a problem with the back subjects and um, you know as, as a parent I talk now I want my son, daughter, to learn a language. I want them to uh, have a good education in geography and history. Where I've got the issue is I also want them to have drama, to have PE, to have design and technology. And that's precisely what we're looking at in terms of the breadth of the curriculum. There's nothing about balance anymore. Balance isn't part of yeah, the Yeah, yeah, got that. It's about breadth and then ambition. And ambition. 
you know, so depth, if you like, but breadth and ambition. Is it ambitious? Is it at least as ambitious as the national curriculum? And the link to the national curriculum is really important. And I know design technology is very, <laughs> there's not a lot in the natural curriculum papers about that. But nevertheless, it should be as ambitious. And that's quite important to know because academies, of course, don't have to teach the national curriculum. No, no, no. But, but we would say, no, that's true. But whatever you teach should be as ambitious as the national curriculum. So if you're not teaching design and technology, then you need to have a pretty good excuse. Why not? How else are you ensuring that those ambitions that are in the national curriculum are being delivered? Fulfilled. Yeah, OK, fair enough. And finally, before we close... The subject is where it is. I have to admit, I'm an optimist. I think this is too important a subject to, to drop off the curriculum. And I, I have seen little chinks of light, and I think Ofsted's framework is helping. It's definitely helping. What do you see as the future for the subject? I couldn't agree with you more that the framework is helping. And I think the framework gives a whole new structure, a whole new impetus to design and technologies, understanding about what it's for and where it's going and the value it has for, for, for pupils' education. So I am optimistic that this framework will reinvigorate that discussion because certainly when I was teaching, we didn't have a national curriculum for most of the time. It was a bit when, I, when we did. And there would be lots of debates about, well, what is it we want these children to learn by the end of year nine? What are the things we want them to know about? And there'd be discussions about that. There have rarely been in the last 10 years or so those sorts of discussions. And that comes back to ITE, doesn't it? Where it's the, you know, the curriculum really is where it yeah. all starts. Yes. And if you're not being taught, and, and we're finding at the moment there are a generation of teachers out there now that have really not been engaged in the curriculum. No, yet. no, absolutely. And also... The definition of the curriculum has been very narrow. The curriculum is defined as GCSEs yeah. or the timetable. Yeah. But actually the curriculum is all that you would want pupils to have studied over the time they're at school. All the things that everybody feels are important concepts to know about. And that includes lunchtime clubs, after school clubs, absolutely. what they bring in from sea cadets or whatever it might be. Uh, absolutely. It all comes together. Yes, yes. Brian, it's been fab. It's been enlightening. Hopefully, uh, everybody out there has picked up some little tips along the way here from here as is to. Uh, I think Ofsted is, is, is doing the right thing at the moment, I must admit. I think Ofsted is, is, is looking and trying to make as fair a system out there as possible. And I think the new framework gives our subjects every hope of really thriving in the future. Thanks very much, Brian. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If you did, hit the subscribe button now as we have guests lined up for future pods that will inform, inspire, and entertain. This podcast is brought to you by the Design and Technology Association.